guys, welcome back. This is the third section of our first chapter. Now in last section, we have talked about how to quantify our investment goals. That's by different categories of returns. We have also talked about the possibility that we might have more than one future. So, how to vividly show our future, how to present the possibility of future results in one graphic. Here is the probability distribution. Now, there's only one pillar in the middle, amounting to the height of 1.0. So 1.0 of probability is the full reality. When an asset has only one and one only future, then it means there's no uncertainty. There's only certainty. So that fits the category of risk-free asset. And we can tell by the x-axis, that's 5%. It means this risk-free rate has a rate of return of 5%. And only, only this result. So 1.0 probability. Now, here is the probability distribution of a risky asset. It had three possible returns. It's obvious because we have three pillars. But the height is different. And these two, on the left side and right side, they are lower, possibly around the height of 0 0.50. That's 50%, right? Here, it's more likely to be 70%. If we add these three pillars together, we will have the height of 1.0. And that gives us the full probability distribution. That gives us the full reality. Now, we can see that which one is more likely to be in the future. This one, right? This one's more likely because it's higher. And these two on both sides. They are a less likely but still dear possible case. Well, that's negative 20%. That's positive 20%. And here is positive 10%. So if we want to calculate the expected return, let me jog your memory. What we need to do is times this minus 20% with its probability of 15% and then plus this 70% times its rate of return of 10%. And then we have this one. So use the probability of 15% and then times its possible return, that's 20%. Add them together, we will have our expected rate of return. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you are missing out in last video. Go back. Now, here is one other risky investment. So different from the previous one, there are 10 pillars, each one with the same height. So that tells us that each possible result have the exactly same probability. So these are two types of, well, just two examples, actually, two examples of the probability distribution of risky asset. Now, we have covered a graphic way to show the presence of multiple future by probability distribution. Try to say probability by 10 times. You'll have a very twisty tongue. Okay, to our topic. So, after we graphically show the presence of risk, let's conclude a theoretical definition for the presence of risk. Risk occurs when we have more than one future. If we have many much more possible futures, each very apart from each other, then we have a high level of uncertainty that translates to a high level of risk. So, a risk need to be quantified because it can reflect 
the degree of uncertainty. It tells us how unlikely we can realize our expectations for the future. And to calculate the risk we have, well, we have kind of many definitions, but the most essential one in our finance terms is the variance. Because variance, very much like the pure rate of return, is a sum product. It's the joining force of all sorts of risks. So all risks joining together give us the total package of risk. That total package is normally captured by variance. So we have known that variance is an indication of total risk. Now, here's how we can quantify it, how we can measure it. Remember, this is the equation of variance for one single asset that has multiple outlooks for future returns. So, here's the equation. It's basically a sum of square. Square of what? The first possible returns minus the expected returns. But what is given by expected returns? It is the average of all the possible returns. So one possible returns minus the average possible returns, and then raised to the power of two. So that's square. And then times the square with probability. Probability for what? Well, for these possible returns, and these two, has to be paired. Don't miss it. These two has to be paired. So that give us the first elements in our variance equations. How many elements like this will we have in this one equation? Well, that depends on the number of expectations we hold for the future. If we have a six, still six, right? Six expectations for the future, then we will have six elements, six squares paired with probability, like this. And then we add all these squares together. And this product here tells us the variance of one single asset that has not one, but many outlooks for future results. So that's it. So that's our memory, the end of our memory for the high school mathematical class. Okay, now, still, the memories goes on. A more relative measure of what we consider to be equivalent to a variance is standard deviation. So it is simply the variance taking the square root. That's it, very easy. And in finance, standard deviation and variance are equivalent when we measure the total risk. Just pay attention to what is asked for in the question. Okay, the last one. The last one that we use to measure the risk of expectations or the risk of our future is CV. That's coefficient of variance. I think this might be a new one for many of you. So when do we use this term? When we need two investment to be compared with each other. So why do we compare them? Why we use this to compare them? Well, we will compare them to know which one is better, right? But these two investment may not be comparable at the first time. For example, they might have very, very different expected rate of return. So to directly compare their variance would be just unfair. It's just unjustified. So we want to put them in the same level to see the return risk balance out or trade off. So what we can use here is the coefficient of variance. So it is calculated by the two elements we have very familiar now. We use the SD, that's the standard deviation of the expected returns. And then we divide it by expected returns of itself. It tells us that if we want to have one more unit of expected return, what we need to bear 
in terms of risk. So, a more risky asset would give us higher returns. We know that. But there might be difference in terms of the efficiency of investment because one might need to undertake a higher level of risk to have the same unit of expected return compared to the other one. So if one has a larger CV, that means a less desirable or less efficient choice of investments because we want this one to be lower. It means that to have another unit of return, we can simply have a lower risk to face. So a lower CV is more desirable. Now, remember that the variance, the SD, that's the standard deviation, these are absolute values. These are absolute values that don't go anywhere. We need a relative value to compare to different investments because when they are not comparable to each other, as I said, they might have very different expected returns. And then to directly compare their variance are not real, just seems unjustified, we use this one. So this is a relative measurement. One CV is not useful. We need to at least have two to compare them off each other. Okay. Now we have see at least, well, many equations in previous sections. We here have an example. This is our expectation for one investment asset. We have different expectations because we have different ideas about the future economy. So we have three ideas. They are weak, static, and strong economy. So we expect different returns for different status of economy, which is normal. And we can see that from weak to strong, the return goes from low to high. So it's understandable because a market with more investment opportunity or more growing opportunity can actually provide a higher rate of return. Because if the government, if the companies want to jump to the train of rapid growth, they are willing to pay higher compensation to the capital they raised. So there's that. Now the first question is what is your expected rate of return? Quite easy, right? We know that. We just times each possibility with its probability. And then we add these three product together. And then that's it. That's 6%. You might ask why shouldn't we divide them by three? Remember, we have paired them with the probability. If we don't have the probability, we add them together, divided by three. But now we have the probability, which amounting to one. So we can simply just use that, the product, and then add them together. So that's the expected return for one single asset with multiple futures. Now, the standard deviation, remember, SD is being asked, not variance. Let me lower my apps here. <laughs> Let's just pretend there is one. <laughs> okay, the standard deviation. First elements, possible returns, minus expected returns, raised to the power of two, times the probability of 15%. So, that's our first elements. The last two goes like this but always remember to pair this possibility with their probability. Always pair them, don't miss it. Okay, and then we add these squares together, we take the square root because we are asked to produce the standard deviation. So that's our result. Let's guess what's the next question. Let's compute the coefficient of variance Remember, the coefficient of variance is not useful just by one, but here just for the sake of practice, right? So, to use the formula, standard deviation of returns divided 
by the expected return. We have the result of 1.04. It tells us that to have one more unit of return, we need to bear 1.04 unit of risks. And also remember, coefficient of variance is not useful in singular term. You need to compare it because it is a relative term. So that's the meaning, that's the reason why it exists and why we use it in finance. Now, it comes to the end of this section. In this section, we have covered how to quantify risk. We use variance, standard deviation, and also a relative, remember, relative risk measurement of coefficient of variance. All are very useful. Now, after we have quantifying them, the next step would be starting from the base to evaluate where are the source of these risks. Help us to better understand what we are fighting for or fighting off in the finance market. Okay, that's the end of this section. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.